Good morning and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining members of the Healthcare Authority's Health Information Technology Team as we introduce a shared understanding of privacy safeguards and protections necessary to protect private health information during use of the clinical data repository. We're going to do a quick round of introductions to start off. I'm Mackenzie McCormick. I'm a communications consultant with Health IT. I'm Catherine Merkel. I'm the Privacy Officer for the Department of Social and Health Services. Good morning. I'm Matthew King. I'm the Privacy Officer for the Healthcare Authority. Good morning. I'm Karen Jensen. I am the Data Privacy and Security Manager for the Healthier Washington Initiative. Hi, I'm Jenny Eliason. I am the Stakeholder Engagement and Communications Manager for the Health IT team. And my name is Dylan Oxford. I am the Technical Manager for the HIT team. Just a bit of housekeeping before they begin. We are recording this webcast and we'll make it available on demand from our website. I have placed everyone on mute to control any background noise. As questions arise, we ask that you type them in the chat or question window and submit them to us. At the end of the presentation, we're going to host a Q&A from the questions submitted regarding stage one scope and HIPAA enabled exchange. I will gather all submitted questions and answers and produce a follow-up FAQ sheet to be emailed to all registrants and posted on our website. I'm now going to turn it over to Jenny Eliason. Thanks, Mackenzie. And thank you to all of you who have invested this chunk of time this morning to join us. This conversation today provides us the first opportunity to share the high-level results of a one-year collaborative study by privacy representatives from multiple state agencies. They were tasked with delivering a common understanding of how our state agencies will enforce HIPAA protections that apply to the private health information contained in the clinical data repository during stage one of this statewide effort. The first stage of the clinical data repository, also known as the CDR, begins accepting information February of 2017. So you may wonder how we reached this point of hosting a community conversation about privacy and the safeguards to protect the private health information exchanged via the statewide health information exchange and clinical data repository. So in the early 2000s, the feds determined the need to build technology, specifically health information technology, to support authorized access to patient records, regardless of their employer, the region they seek care in, the care provider organization, or insurance company. And they started that conversation early in the 2000s. And it didn't take very long before there were real life instances demonstrating what the capability and the needs really are. Hurricane Katrina was a good uh, conversation that started off about having people have to uh, move to multiple areas geographically and not have their medical records follow with them. Um, another instance was with the 9-11 happening. So in 2004, at the federal level, they uh, did an executive order, and in 2009, Congress mandated the work. They started out with the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, brought about the high tech the Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Act. And the, those were designed to promote the widespread exchange of integrated clinical records between authorized providers. In 2009, our state began to set up our program. And uh, Washington State uh, Substitute Senate Bill 5501 in 2009 appointed designees to lead our statewide efforts. HCA, the Healthcare Authority, was appointed the lead state agency for health information technology, electronic health records incentive payment program, and to lead the, the charge in interoperability across our state. One Healthport was awarded as the lead organization to develop and further statewide health information exchange that uh, extends beyond organizational boundaries or regional divisions. Our agency, HCA's first step was to build the infrastructure across our state with providers and hospitals joining the electronic health records incentive payment program. We administer the Medicaid end of that 
and it, we pay out federal incentive monies to help providers purchase, upgrade, install, and begin using certified electronic health record systems and expand the health information infrastructure, kind of like highway building. And we're happy to report that to date, 88 eligible hospitals in our state and over 6,300 eligible providers have already received over $320 million. And the program hasn't ended yet. There's still uh, time for providers to join into this and receive payments over the next few years. So with the supportive infrastructure being built and expanded across the state, it became time to engage stakeholders that might benefit and be impacted by the clinical data repository in our state. So we were kind of reaching that tipping point of providers wanting to coordinate care, but have more data to support their care decisions. So with the informational pathways expanded, we began identifying coordination of care gaps, sharing our state's health IT interoperability strategy, and started meeting with advocacy groups, professional associations, and the major delivery systems. One of our first efforts was to engage with these major delivery systems across our state. So in September of 2014, uh, Dorothy Teeter and our HCA leadership hosted a meeting in Olympia called Statewide Health Information Exchange, a strategic conversation with delivery system leaders. The main goal was to learn what the needs were, what the concerns were, and we wanted to start identifying what the community gaps are that a CDR solution might help to close. As the appointed state agency to lead these efforts, it was important to us to understand what their opinion was of what role the state could play in supporting the delivery system communities. We started by inviting leaders from 21 major delivery systems across our state. 13 accepted the invitation and participated in a very productive half-day conversations. These were hosted by Dorothy Teeter, Marianne Lindeblad, Dr. Charissa Fotinos, and Nathan Johnson. And the main topics everyone discussed that day were the EHR, the Electronic Health Records Incentive Payment Program progression, our plan for a clinical data repository to gather and integrate clinical records, identification of the challenges that the organizations were facing in achieving greater interoperability, and the reduction of point-to-point -point sharing and associated costs and resources. And then, of course, what we're going to talk about today, one of the topics brought up that day and discussed, was privacy and security of the information. So some of the findings that came out of that meeting were that there was an agreement that a clinical data repository, if it was outside of the state's firewalls, so that others in the community would benefit from purchasing and using as well, that that solution could meet many of their data and reporting needs. The second finding was that there was still much confusion about things such as, is electronic exchange of uh, PHI protected any differently in paper records? or being mailed or faxed versus an electronic exchange of the same information. Another one was, what exactly is covered under HIPAA and what additional safeguards need to be in place prior to exchanging the more sensitive information protected by CFR 42.2? So at the end of the meeting, we made an ask of them and said, what role do you think it makes sense for the state to play? They felt it would help their entities if the state, if under our leadership, would gather multiple state agencies to study and consider federal and state laws governing the sharing of private health information between authorized parties. Once a common understanding was defined, they wanted us to share what the state agency's common understanding is so that the greater provider community might consider that um, to help guide their efforts. We agreed to that, and our team began to develop an approach for that work. So this initiative, this multi-year initiative of the Clinical Data Repository, is a staged multi-year approach. 
And the first group of lives that we determined we could sponsor were the ones that we're most responsible for initially, which is the Apple Health Medicaid patients who are assigned to managed care organizations. So for that group, we're starting with 1.4 million Medicaid-insured lives. Those will be the first participants in the clinical data repository. The five managed care organizations are funding partners with us. They are paying the cost per life per year to keep a patient's record current within the clinical data repository. So in a sponsorship model, we have our executive sponsors, Dorothy Teeter. We have partner agency representative sponsors, which are from Department of Health, it's Dr. Brian Takaris, from Department of Social and Health Services, Katie Ruckel. And for HCA, we have Dr. Charissa Fotino. So I mentioned it's a staged approach. And stage one, we're only going to accept and exchange data that is already protected under HIPAA. So it'll be HIPAA-enabled exchange for stage one, which begins early in 2017. Stage two, we don't have an exact date for. We know it'll be about a year, year and a half after that. And that is when we will also have done more preparatory work and be ready to deal with some of the more sensitive information, such as the data that's protected under CFR 42.2. So a lot of folks uh, have never heard about a clinical data repository or health information exchange. And there's a lot of questions about how does the data get in there, who puts it in there, what kind of effort does it take. So this slide just kind of depicts how the data could flow. And basically, the healthcare authority is uh, submitting in um, adjudicated claims and encounter information to provide a little bit of background of what the patient has had done and treatment rendered prescriptions that have been filled over the last year to two years. The clinical records come from the hospital record itself or from the physician's records themselves directly out of their electronic health record system. So when HealthPort, as our technology partner, began the development of the clinical data repository, applied the functionality and policy guidelines that we at HCA put in place. So you can see that the data flows from the records on the left in through One Health Port's HIE, the Health Information Exchange, that goes statewide, and then into the clinical data repository. So then as a provider is getting ready to see a patient the next day, their electronic health record system could ask the system, do you have any information on uh, Tom Jones? And the system could send back what they know already, what prescriptions this provider has had, or, excuse me, not provider, what prescriptions this patient has had, uh, what treatment they've received, and what their last, say, five chief complaints were. So in this model, consent is managed as it is today at the point of care by the providers performing and coordinating care. As data builds in the clinical data repository, reporting capabilities will be added. So with that kind of high level introduction and background, I want to share just a little bit of high level timeline information showing what we've been doing and kind of where we're at right now. So in 2014, I shared that we did some of our strategic planning. We scoped it. We staged the project into stage one and two initially. Uh, we started in with planning for outreach and beginning the outreach with the large delivery systems. We started community conversations with different advocacy groups, and we began meeting with the managed care organizations in partnership to do planning and um, carrying out some of the preparatory work between HCA and the managed care organizations. Between 2015 and 16, we've been doing a lot of different activities. We began the work groups. And uh, the first one that got started was uh, communication. It's an interagency communication work group that has members participating from six state agencies. And we meet about every month and a half to two months. We review documents, 
and um, messaging or posting on our shared websites, our individual websites, and on um, publications that are shared to the provider community. We have a data classification work group, and um, my coworker Dylan will be sharing about those findings. And then we have the privacy work group hosted by Karen Jensen, and she'll be sharing about those findings. We continued uh, with outreach, more in-depth outreach. Uh, the technology partner we have in One Health Part began several monthly outreach options for vendors and providers to participate in. We outlined what the participation criteria was for the first group of providers being requested to participate. We've held the EHR vendor monthly meetings, the provider readiness monthly meetings, uh, professional association monthly meetings, and um, we hosted some federal conversations between our agency, some of the electronic health record vendors leading in the community, and um, the Office of the National Coordinator and uh, CMS about certification requirements and what the system should have the capability to do. And then as mentioned, starting in 2017, we have the first live uh, submissions of care summaries that will come into the clinical data repository beginning in February. And we'll just continue to build as more and more providers are ready and begin submitting. And then also at some point in 2017, we will begin the next round of outreach preparation for stage two, which will be with the behavioral health community, the substance use disorder community, um, productive, uh, child uh, reproductive services groups. And so we'll begin all of that preparation work uh, for stage two. So that is where we're at to date, and so I think what I'll do is turn this over to Dylan Oxford, our Health Information Technology Technical Manager, and he'll share about the data classification work that's taken place in preparation for the clinical data repository. Thanks, Jenny. So as Jenny said, we're going to spend a few minutes talking about the data classification methods available within Certified Electronic Health Record Systems and certified clinical documents, and how decisions on classification factor into the role-based access control policy within Link for Health. Let's talk about the data classification. The HCA establishes the responsibility of the supplier of clinical or claim information to code any data submitted to the clinical data repository with appropriate confidentiality code, and then exclude any submissions that has been requested not to be shared. Some background information on this. A key point is that Link for Health is primarily a tool to collect and exchange clinical data using the Consolidated Clinical Document Architecture, or CCDA, standard. Since the CCDA header requires a confidentiality code, so does Link for Health. This classification requires some shared responsibility between the agency and the providers as both entities are users and submitters of the data within the system. There will need to be fine-tuning and adjustments of this process as we move along and the technology matures. So these are the standard HL7 classification codes, which are applicable to HIPAA-covered data. Most data will be considered normal health data, but there are scenarios such as a doctor's visit where substance use is discussed or treatment related to child abuse where the decision could be made to increase the sensitivity. There are more codes available within the CCDA standard, but it's unlikely that the data submitted to Link for Health should ever be coded at less than normal classification. Another key note here, for a large amount of EHR systems, the classification defaults to normal and can't be changed. There is work to be done as a community to mature and enhance the processes around classification, and the agency, along with our partners at One Health Corp, want to support this process. The entire standard, including more detail on these classification codes, is available on HL7's website, and we'll give you a link to the standard at the end of this webinar. 
So now we want to talk a little bit about HCA's own classification efforts on the data that we're supplying to Link for Health. We're supplementing the clinical data within Link for Health with administrative data, namely the diagnoses and procedure codes which appear on submitted claims. To this end, the agency created two additional work groups to help us make the decisions on how to classify the data which we are submitting ourselves. The privacy work group focused on applicable laws, the what and why portions of this process, and the classification work group focused on the how. HCA has published a white paper describing how we will segment and or classify data for our own data submissions. And for those of you that have started onboarding efforts with One Health Port, you may have seen this white paper already. But we'll send you a link at the end of this anyway. So why is the classification important? The classification allows for some granularity to be applied within the user roles within the Link for Health application feeding into our overall role-based access approach. It provides the ability for Link for Health to ensure that the sensitive data is only allowed for users with a need to access the full medical record. And it helps us prevent an all-or-nothing approach to the data on most clients and allows for additional confidence for a vulnerable population that their health data is being managed appropriately. In the end, it offers us multiple layers of protection throughout the system. The participation agreement that all HIE and CDR business associates sign creates a shared understanding of the use and responsibilities within the system. Then the access roles are assigned through a federated model, allowing providers to ensure that the right staff have the appropriate access as their staffing and workflow needs adapt and change. And then finally, the classification coding provides the final layer of segmentation within the system itself. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Karen Jensen to talk about the privacy work group. So good morning, everyone. So as you, heard, as you have heard already today, implementing a clinical data repository as a link for health priority strategy involves the collection and exchange of administrative and clinical data that is directly connected to individual patients. So this information also known as protected health information or PHI. And it's all protected under federal and state law. At the federal level, that protection comes from the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, also known as HIPAA, and its associated privacy and security regulations. There's a separate and very specific federal law and accompanying regulations for substance use disorder treatment program records, commonly described by the shorthand 42 CFR Part 2. At the state level, our central governing law in Washington is Washington's Uniform Health Care Information Act, which can be found at Chapter 7002 of our revised Code of Washington. And there are other statutes as well that put legal boundaries on sharing or use of protected information in some cases. So the application of these laws, both state and federal, is not always straightforward. And this can lead to what I like to call privacy speed bumps, or what happens when there is hesitancy to share protected health information. And this can happen because the same laws can be subject to different legal interpretations, different policy applications, misperceptions, and myths. There can be an overinterpretation of regulations and laws out of fear because there can be significant civil and sometimes federal or sometimes um, criminal liability for inappropriately disclosing information. There are sometimes, as we've discovered, some impressions out there that different state agencies even have different interpretations about some of these laws. There can even be changes in laws that happen, but that haven't been fully understood or implemented by the health delivery system. So as you heard earlier, there was a request from stakeholders for a unified state voice about how the state and federal laws would apply to the protected health information collected and exchanged under the Link for Health Clinical Data Repository Initiative. So the healthcare authority response to the stakeholder request 
was to convene a work group. We know that many stakeholders are interested in this work, um, and that's certainly reflected in the number of people who have signed on and are listening to this webinar today. But the approach that was taken was to start with the state health and human service agencies that you can see listed on this slide. And the reason for starting with that kind of a little bit more internal state agency conversation was that these agencies have programs that support the health and well-being of Washington residents. These programs have client records, which often include confidential information protected by state or federal law. In addition, the clinical data repository will potentially benefit many of these clients by providing better coordination of care. As you heard earlier today, the first stage of implementing the clinical data repository is to support care for the 1.4 million people in Washington who are enrolled in Medicaid-managed care through the Apple Health Program. The members of the work group with privacy officers or designees from the state agencies, again listed on this slide. And in addition, we have representative subject matter experts from within agencies. For example, we have subject matter experts from across many of the different administrations within the Department of Social and Health Services join in this work. The work group was convened a little over a year ago in the fall of 2015. This was a chartered work group. And this slide includes the chartered purpose and scope. And that purpose and scope were to support provider adoption and use of the Link for Health Clinical Data Repository through developing and sharing a unified interpretation among hum human uh, state health and human service agencies of what is compliant under state and federal privacy laws for health information collection, use, and sharing in the context of the health information exchange in Washington. Our deliverables were documentation of the shared interpretation among agencies and a communications plan and strategy to share this work. And this webinar today is really a kickoff and a big part of that communication plan. So we're going to share the outcome of the work group work that was done in support of stage one implementation of the CDR and to get your questions and your feedback today. Our time frame again was a kickoff very first kickoff meeting a little over a year ago in September of 2015. We really got down to work in October of 2015. And our larger group held 13 meetings between that kickoff and the end of May. We had some smaller subgroups look at some other specific categories of information through June of 2016. And the work has continued more behind the scenes, but very important ongoing work nonetheless in terms of making sure we have good coordination and classification, uh, good coordination with the classification and access work group, extensive internal review of, of all of the uh, work and research and outcome discussions that the privacy work group held, and then again, coordination with the com communications campaign culminating in the webinar today. So overall, to go back to the work group and our activities through that time, when we launched, we had to bring work group members up to speed with the clinical data repository and some of that background information you heard at the beginning of the webinar today. We asked our uh, members of the work group to go back to their agencies and programs and do some re research. What are the rules and policies and statutes from their perspectives and their subject matter expertise? Um, uh, perspectives that are the things we need to be looking at that protect client information in particular, protected health information. The group adopted some guiding principles and key messages before diving into the deep substantive work of reviewing specific categories of protected health information. And then again, we've continued on um, since the formal convening of the work group with report development and review. I want to talk a little bit next about guiding principles and why the work group took this approach. From the outset, work group members really understood the value of coming together for a thorough assessment of the privacy laws 
and to identify possible implications of the CDR implementation from their agency perspective. Members also understood that the group's chartered purpose and scope did not extend to the technical and operational details at the clinical data repository. That's the how that Dylan was talking about. But the group continued to express strong interest in getting an understanding of that how and how the CDR would be implemented in a way that would meet both the, the legal and privacy and security standards. So the work took the approach of looking at national principles that have already been developed for the electronic exchange of protected health information. After some research, the group landed on adopting the National Privacy and Security Framework for the Electronic Exchange of Individually Identifiable Health Information. Not quite word for word, we had some substantive, not, not substantive changes, but some updating of wording and so on for consistency. And we landed there because these principles that I'll go over in the next slide have really stood the test of time. They continue to be cited as foundational principles. They were published by the Federal Department of Health and Human Services under the Office of National Coordinator for Health Technology in 2008. But again, they've really stood the test of time. And there will be a link provided to that document uh, at the close of the webinar today. So the guiding principles that you can see on this slide are around correction. And individuals should be provided a timely means to dispute the accuracy and integrity of their protected health information and to have erroneous information corrected. There should be openness and transparency about policies, procedures, and technologies that directly affect individuals and their protected health information. Individuals should be provided a reasonable opportunity and, and capability to make informed decisions about the collection, use, and disclosure of their information. Protected health information should be collected, used, and disclosed only to the extent necessary to accomplish a specific purpose and never to discriminate inappropriately. Safeguards are important. Protected health information should be protected with reasonable administrative, technical, and physical safeguards to ensure its confidentiality in, and integrity, and in order to prevent unauthorized or inappropriate access, use, or disclosure. There should be reasonable steps taken to ensure that protected health information is complete, accurate, and up-to-date. So data quality and integrity are very important. It's also important to make sure that, again, this information is used for its intended purpose and to make sure it is not altered or destroyed in an unauthorized manner. And finally, finally accountability. The principles in the privacy and security framework should be implemented and adherence assured through the appropriate monitoring and other means and methods that should be in place to report and mitigate non-adherence and breaches. So the significance of these principles really is twofold. First of all, by adopting the national principles, it keeps our work here at the state level in alignment with national efforts in this area. And adopting these principles was a way for the work group to inform leadership at the healthcare authority of what the group felt were foundational principles and really necessary for putting the policy, administrative, technical, and physical safeguards in place that address each of these principles. There was some additional work that the work group was asked to do in support of Stage 1 CDR implementation. And that was the identification of stakeholders. So while a communication work group had and had already been up and running to support the Link for Health initiative. The Privacy Work Group had the opportunity to continue to inform that work and from the perspectives of the state agencies and administrations in place, make sure that there were uh, stakeholders identified from across the delivery system and the various uh, programs within state agencies. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to go deeply into that stakeholder work. But some other work that we were asked to do 
was to come up with some key messages and findings. And again, I won't cover all of those key messages and findings today, but this slide has several of, of them listed for you. And, and that is that the work group collectively felt that access to timely electronic patient data can improve the care that is provided to patients. That efforts should be made to find technology solutions to enable sharing of protected health information within applicable law. And that the opportunity for access to integrated health information through the CDR is beneficial for the continuity of care. With that background in work, the work group took some time to do some deep work looking at several categories of protected health information. And so we did this work consistent with our charter. And again, the framework that we were looking at was the clinical data repository. So we started by looking at what I would call general health information. This is information like a sprained ankle or a sore throat, not subject to some heightened protection elsewhere in state or federal law. Uh, but we looked at, at other categories as well that, again, were identified by work group members during the um, uh, research phase of our work and that will become relevant as we work toward stage two implementation of the clinical data repository. And again, keep in mind that our working model was the clinical data repository and the work group really took a very deliberate approach in how we looked at any particular category of record. And there was a, a earlier slide, slide four in the slide deck, that looked at the anticipated data flow. So when you think about the data flow, we really have to be thinking about that process, that transactional process, and look at the legal authority for a data holder to share PHI with the CDR, and then look at the legal authority, authority for a data recipient to request and then receive that information. So starting first with general health information, and again, context of the Link for Health CDR initiative. So one of our key findings there was, unless subject to more stringent legal requirements, both the federal HIPAA and standard and the Washington Uniform Healthcare Information Act allow disclosure of protected information to another healthcare provider without additional authorization for treatment payment or healthcare operations. And that treatment payment and healthcare operations language is from the HIPAA federal statute, but I think there's broad agreement. There are generally comparable uh, uh, standards in place, even though worded differently in our Washington state law. This key finding supports stage one implementation of the clinical data repository. And you've heard, as you've heard from Dylan today, the healthcare authority is only submitting administrative and claims data that would be considered general information or normal as expressed in terms of the technical aspects of data classification, again, for stage one implementation. This aligns with and is consistent with the historical way that health information has been shared, whether it's paper record, fax, other means of transmission, electronic health records, and now the clinical data repository. So if all today's focus is the stage one implementation of the clinical data repository, I do want to spend a few minutes covering some of the work group's findings about one category of records, and that's mental health information. Again, healthcare authority is targeting mental health information for stage two of CDR implementation. And I think that stems from work already underway and a general understanding of mental health information as one of those categories of health information, like substance use disorder and STD information that historically has had heightened levels of prediction of, of protection. But for mental health information, as the work group took a very careful look, we looked at the federal law and um, HIPAA at the federal level does not contain any specific terms for mental health information with the exception of psychotherapy notes. And psychotherapy notes have very significant and specific heightened privacy protection at the federal level as well as at the state level. 
turning our attention then toward Washington law, I think anyone who's worked in this area at all would agree that the Washington state laws governing the privacy of mental health information are extensive and they're complex. Washington law has historically provided heightened protection for mental health information, including the fact of admission for treatment. However, and the reason that I wanted to make sure that, that this category of information was part of the webinar today was for mental health information, some of these laws have evolved substantially over the last several years. There was legislation in our state in 2013 that consolidated the statutes for the confidentiality of mental health information under the Washington Uniform Healthcare Information Act. Many of the more restrictive mental health standards were maintained around confidentiality of that information. But there were also some changes and additions for disclosure without patient authorization. And if you're interested in that specific legislation, it was House Bill 1679 from the 2013 legislative session, and it was effective July 1st, 2014. The work group took a careful look at those recent legislative changes and, again, applied that disciplined look of authority to share information and authority to receive that information. With those changes and also considering other legislative changes, that have mandated the integration of healthcare in a more broad sense. The work group reached the consensus that the um, sharing of information for treatment purposes is really on parity with the federal HIPAA standard, again, for treatment um, purposes and general health information. This is a change from how many of us have understood mental health information to be treated under the law and under Washington law. And I think we have a change opportunity. And so we have an opportunity introducing this to you today and for outreach to our health system partners about the impacts of the recent legislative change and how they really support the immediate need we have for sharing physical and mental health information in support of other initiatives to manage integrated care. So what are our challenges and opportunities going ahead? Well, with respect to privacy and the clinical data repository and other health initiatives, this is definitely a time of both challenges and opportunities. The healthcare landscape itself is very dynamic and changing. We have a dynamic policy environment and a dynamic legislative environment. I think one of the things we learned coming together as state agencies, that there's great value in having a shared understanding of what the state and federal laws really mean in terms of the exchange and use of federal of protected health information. And as partners all together in this work, those of you on the phone today, I think that um, you can appreciate that value as well. And today's webinar is really a first opportunity to share some of the state agency's perspectives via the privacy work group and, again, that's the lens that we put on it of the clinical data repository. We really need to build partnerships and a broader shared understanding. And I'm confident that this is just the beginning of some work we can be doing together to support care coordination. So while well, in the interest of time, since today's focus was stage one of the clinical data repository, uh, I'm not going to be going into detail about some of the other categories of protected health information that the privacy work group looked at, and those are really more relevant, as Dylan and Jimmy both mentioned, to stage two implementation. So at this point, I will turn it back over to Jimmy to discuss next steps. Thanks, Karen. So uh, the last two slides are basically some resource slides for you folks. So one of them is our health information technology website hosted here at the Healthcare Authority. On that we have um, recordings, webinars, um, and over the next month there will be several new ones that are going to be very short topical webcasts that are recorded. Um, Maybe one might be how to onboard, how to get ready. Another one might be um, how do we change our flow of business? Um, how is this going to impact our daily um, 
time with patients, that type of thing. So be watching for some of those as they come online there uh, in the next month. We also have some, uh, a newsletter that goes out every month. Most of you, I think, are probably receiving it. We have about 6,000, close to 7,000 now uh, registered recipients for the newsletter. And in that, you'll get monthly updates directly into your email inbox uh, on uh, registration for webcasts, uh, upcoming meetings around the state, and of uh, progression on both the electronic health records incentive payment program as well as the clinical data repository stage one. And then eventually as we start working towards preparation for stage two, there will be more information on that. Um, a direct email to our health IT teams is listed. One HealthPort is our technology partner. They are the ones standing up this service. We are a customer of the service. So for any questions about becoming a sponsor for a different group of lives, some organizations are doing that. Um, well, we are the first customer. There's already one other, and I believe I've heard that there are uh, a couple others in conversation. And then we have information from the Office of the National Coordinator, and they are the ones who did the certification of the electronic health record system. So if there's questions on um, capabilities that your system uh, is supposed to have, or if you have questions about that program itself, that's a great place to go. And then the final slide says resources on the top, and that's got some of this other information that we referred to while we were speaking today the National Privacy and Security Framework for the Electronic Exchange of Individually Identifiable Health Information. There's a link to that, the Data Classification Guideline. Dylan has provided that link, as well as the HL7 standard. So with that, that completes the presentation portion, and we want to entertain answering some of the questions that people have been typing in uh, while we have been sharing. So let's see, Dylan, there's a question up there. Could we please get a list of all the types of data that need to be classified under the restricted and very restricted? Sure. And so on the One Health Port link that's uh, there on that resources slide, and we'll be giving these slides as well as a uh, recording of this webinar uh, out shortly, there is both a link to the paper that we described during the classification portion of the presentation as well as there is supporting documentation with a code list that has how the state is using procedure and diagnosis codes to apply restricted or very restricted classifications. In addition, there are some other code tips on there, namely provider taxonomy codes that also support some of the decisions described within the paper. Great, thank you. And it looks like we have a question on whether the slides would be made available. Absolutely. Those are going to be sent out at the uh, completion of this. Uh, as mentioned by McKinsey earlier, we're recording this also. And this will be put on our webcast. The questions that are being asked now, or if after you log off, you have some thoughts afterwards, Please feel free to submit those questions to the email address to the Health IT team that's listed on the resource slides. Uh, and we'll go ahead and include those in a uh, FAQ that we're going to produce uh, to provide these answers in written format. Do you want to read the question? Yeah. So I'm going to ask Karen to answer the next question. And that is, when you say HIPAA-protected data, are you also including the state health privacy law, RCW 70.02? Yes, that's a great question. Thank you. So we tended to use HIPAA protected data or HIPAA enabled data as a shorthand to reflect what is allowable to be shared under the HIPAA standard for treatment payment and operations and under the state health care information law for the types of information that are not subject to some other heightened level of protection. So uh, while well, the phrase doesn't directly reference 7002, it's really kind of a shorthand that we have used here uh, at the Health Care Authority to really be in condition to involved. Thank you, Karen.
And that is the sum of the questions that we've received so far. So if you think of anything else, go ahead and submit them to our email box. We thank you each for your time and the investment. And be watching for us to come for meetings in your community. Thank you.